Hello, sweethearts. It's Rowan, and, uh, so, I, uh, I'm gonna be winging it for, uh, for this book review. So, um, real quick, just to bring you up to speed, uh, this is The Ghosts of Blood and Innocence. This is book three of the Raythu Histories, uh, trilogy. Um, so, it is the final book. Uh, this would be the second of the, uh, the Raythu, um, trilogies by Storm Constantine. The first would be the Raythu Chronicles. I have done a, um, a video book report on that one. Um, I've, I've got an omnibus edition that's about, like, yay thick. So, like, yay. Um, and I've done video book reports of the first two of the Histories Trilogy. I will have a link in the description uh, below, so you can go check those out if you want to be brought up to speed. Assuming you have been brought up to speed already, uh, let me first um, give a quick uh, rundown of what goes on in this, because a lot goes on in this book. Like, to the point that I ran out of pencil leads. Well, I ran out of lead for my pencil. I've got other leads in here somewhere. I've got somewhere in this apartment is my little, um, jobby full of pencil leads. Damned if I know where it is right now. I've looked everywhere that makes any kind of sense, meaning it is now officially somewhere that makes no sense. And when it's somewhere that makes no sense, you got a problem. So, enough about me and my problems. So, uh, the, uh, the first thing that, uh, so first we are introduced to Darkiel. Darkiel is the, um, Harling who was born of the pearl that was literally cut from Kairu's body, uh, in the Shades of Time and Memory. Again, you're going to need to watch the other two if you haven't been brought up to speed already, okay? Go watch them. Go watch them. Go watch... Well, the other three videos. Go watch them. Watch them now. Uh, so, yeah, Kairu's body. Uh, the pearl was literally cut from his body, and that was containing Darkiel. So Darkiel is the first one... Well, the first new character we meet in this one. And, yeah. Actually, yeah, he is literally the first character we meet. <laughs> I'm sorry, I finished this book about a month ago. So Darkiel is the first character we meet, and it's revealed pretty early on that, you know, he is of that pearl. So he was delivered to uh, to Fade, who lives in the village of Samway. Fade lives in Samway. Samway is a remote little town that is kind of in a mountainous region, and uh, Raithu and... Uh, humans cohabitate relatively peacefully there, and, you know, there is a statement made that, you know, Fade kind of, um, regards the humans of Samway as kind of the way that somebody with a large private zoo would regard the animals there, that, you know, he, he, he likes having them around, you know, to preserve some of their way, to preserve their ways to an extent anyway, but, you know... He's clearly the one in charge of Samway at this point. But it's remote enough, and Thede leaves, uh, leaves Fade, you know, just enough in the dark as to who is in this pearl and why he needs to be the one, you know, with it as, as his ward, um, you know, as a matter of safety. But again, like it's it's revealed pretty early on that this is that this is Darkiel that this is that Darkiel is this pearl. Um, uh, Fady may be in the dark. Um, as long as you've read the first two books, you will not be. So, um, so yeah. After we meet Darkiel, um, let me just give you a quick synopsis of Darkiel's story. Darkiel has this intuitive knowledge that. He is very much like unlike the other Har in his village. That, you know, and not just because, you know, he's the only one who's basically been adopted. <laughs> but uh, he, he has this intuitive knowledge that, like, 
you know, even on kind of a molecular level, that, you know, he is physically unlike them as well. Like, some even regard him as just kind of spooky, um, though without any clear reasons as to why. Around the time he would be going through his febraya, he's not exactly exhibiting the symptoms and febraya, as if you forgot from the previous videos on this, or you haven't listened to me and gotten brought up, that is right through puberty. So he's not going through it in the same way that others have. And so, like, he he's not even aware he's going through it at all. And it's not really occurring to others that he's going through it either, because he is that much unlike. After all, he was born from the essence of three har rather than two. So, uh, I, I'm not flipping you off. Uh, shit hits the fan, and he has to, you know, go on, you know, a... He ha basically has to go on a quest where he is getting his cast training in the most roundabout way possible. <laughs> uh, cast training is something else. Like, it's... There's this, there's this sort of um, unique magical system that is taught to... Um, most Raithu, especially those, you know, pureborn, and, um, and there are three castes, each with three, you know, there are three, um, distinct castes, um, that, you know, ascend from each other, and each level has three levels within it. Again, like, we've got rules of three that, you know, just seems so obvious to me in Shades, um, and I went on at length about that. So, you know, Darkiel goes through, you know, the most roundabout cast training he can. So, as he's journeying, he, uh, he encounters other characters, including, um, an entity that he first meets and believes is, um, is an etheric entity, but, you know, learns this character also has, you know, a more corporeal form as well. Uh, he, he calls this character Zoo at first, and then learns that Zoo, spoiler alert, is, uh, is part of the, uh, hegemony, um, who we first meet in the Chronicles trilogy. Uh, and this is something that, and it's not exactly known, um, to the hegemony that, you know, uh, Zoo, who we later learn is Veloxus from the Hegemony, uh, can even do this. You know, it's not exactly known to them that he can do this. And the reason he can do this is because while he w was, like the rest of them, incepted horror from human, he wasn't exactly human. And this is learned <laughs> by Darkiel that, you know, living within the Earth in its you know, various layers are another race who are exiled, um, but, you know, another androgynous race, many of whom can pass for human, uh, who have been exiled from their own realm. With, uh, this story also, this book also follows the story of Loki, um, Har Aralis, who is the son of Pelaz, who by the end of Shades of Time and Memory, Pelaz ends up uh, pregnant by Galdra, who is a Frehelenhar. And Frehella is a, uh, is a region, um, as I get out the, uh, the RPG, that has, uh, that has taken over where the Scandinavian Peninsula is. So, Loki's name is not coincidental. Even though Loki is raised to believe he is the, he is the son of Pelaz being the hostling and uh, Kalanth being the father, this is not true. Um, Galdra is his biological father. So, and Loki uh, is named such by Cal as kind of a jab, but not the most successful one, I guess. Um, in fact, uh, Frehella has based their society kind of on ancient Norse society, uh, though it's not clear that they necessarily worship the same gods. Um, you know, though they do, though they are very much aware of the ancient Norse gods. So, 
Um, so this follows Loki, and Loki is living a relatively normal life of a royal born, uh, <laughs> basically royal born, um, within the palace of Feonica in the city of Emanion, the city of Emanion, uh, which is in the country of Almagabra, which we can see is basically um, born from current day Greece. You know, that peninsula. So, you know, we've got some distance there uh, on the map, uh, both, like, physically and culturally. Um, so, uh, as kind of a favor to Galdra, who, you know, it's clear to Galdra that this is his kid. Um, but, you know, it's told to Loki that this is, you know, as sort of a, uh, a political move. He's going to spend his Febraia in Frehella. Um, of course, um, during his, uh, first Aruna, which, you know, um, Raithu has kind of ritualized <laughs> a lot of aspects of life. So they've even ritualized, you know, basically your first time having sex. <laughs> Uh, though this is this is generally um, regarded as a way to um, to activate the um, magic centers of those organs. So so again, there there are reasons that things are a bit different. Even though in human culture, this would be a, this might come off as a little sketchy, but you know it it is what it is, and they're not human anymore. Uh, so, yeah, Loki is, you know, he's spending his febraia, you know, his, you know, puberty rituals in Frehella, and during his, <laughs> yeah, during his first Arana, he's basically kidnapped. He's kidnapped and taken to the other realm world of Thanatep. Uh, Thanatep is where another exiled race was originally from. And we meet one of that race in the Great Library, where Lilim um, basically voluntarily moved to uh, <laughs> um, during a bout of sex magic in the first book of the Histories trilogy. And we briefly see Lilim again in Shades of Time and Memory, when she um, takes on Ponclast as kind of a prisoner, but he has his... You know, he has freedom to move about Thanat or not Thanatep, but the realm of the Great Library. I forget what they call that world. So he has his freedom to move about, you know, that realm amongst the Great Library as much as he wants, but he's not going anywhere. Like, he cannot physically get back to, um, to Earth um, without either use of uh, Sadim, which they're not going to give him that assistance, or without the kind of magics that Lilim has evolved, like, not just spiritually, but physically evolved to learn how to do on her own. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, he's, he's not going anywhere, and, you know, she's not gonna, you know, um, you know, she, she's not going to, uh, make bad on her favor to Palaz and let him out, so, uh, but on the good side in this realm, not only, uh, in the realm of the Great Library, not only do, um, earthly beings have no need or desire for food, drink, or even sleep, um, he is, he is stripped of all, um, all his, all his hate, all his desire to, you know, destroy, you know, the, uh, the, um, Palaz and anything of the earthly realm. He's just, you know, he, he's kind of in this pseudo-Zen sort of state where, you know, he has, you know, no real needs or desires, but at the same time, he does still have a curiosity. So he, um, you know, says to Lilim, well, you know, if you haven't gone beyond the Great Library, why don't we just, like, go see what's there? I mean, you know, worst case, we basically make a loop around and end up back at the library. So she's like, okay, well, we'll yeah, let, let me go you know, along with you, my, you know, I've, um, I think I'm at a good stopping point with the reading, all these, you know, big stone, you know, tablet books that we've got here, so, 
you know, let's let's just go on. And so they uh, they go on and they reach a tomb. So you know, they come upon this tomb where um, one of the original inhabitants of Thanatep has been um, has basically been in stasis. Like, they think at first, okay, maybe he's dead, but wait, no, on closer inspection, he's not dead. He and Lilim then go to Thanatep, and Ponclast goes back to the library. <laughs> so, uh, so Lilim and Take, who was originally of the Thanatep realm, you know, he takes her, he, you know, he takes her to Thanatep, um, somehow. I forget exactly how. <laughs> Probably with magics. That's kind of how a lot of stuff happens in these books. So Take takes Lilim to Thanatep with magics and Ponclast to up and turns back around and heads back to the library because it's like, what else is he gonna do? <laughs> and um and around and just before he's finally reached the library, uh Pilaz and a couple others have uh have come to the library and are like, where the hell is Lilim? And he says, you know, to Pelas, she's out on business. She has no business. Well, she does now. And, um, and so, um, they kind of drop what they came there for Lilim for, because this was something specifically that they wanted to ask Lilim. So, they just do the next best thing, and they're just like, hey, Ponclast, we're pretty sure your sons had something to do with kidnapping Loki. And so, uh, and so Ponclast, like, you know, says, you know, hey, um, you know, so Abermel, who is, um, Pelaz's son with Kairu, who was born back during the Chronicles trilogy, so he's much older than the other two sons. Um, uh, Abermel and Loki were Chesnari, which is, uh, which, which is basically, um, their word for spouse, basically. Sometimes it's given rituals. Sometimes it's just a um, an agreement that you know. Or sometimes it's just a state that the relationship just becomes. You know, like I said, sometimes it's given some kind of ritual significance, like you know, a proper marriage. But other times, like with uh, with with Ulame and um, and Flick, it just kind of happened. It just kind of happened. That's just where their relationship progressed. So, so, uh, so Ponclast, uh, says, you know, hey, you know, so your eldest son, Abramel, he and I were Chisnari, and, you know, just tell him that I'm safe, because I'm sure he's worried about me. Um, but yeah, this does sound like, you know, my other boy, Diablo, and... So he's probably got the other son who was born just before um, I was banished, so uh, that would be uh, Gebrel, um my son with um, Abermel. I forget who hosted Gebrel. I think it was Ponclast. Um, you know, yeah, so, yeah, this sounds like my boys, and please go, please go talk to, to my, to, to my chestnut, you know, and just let him know I'm safe. And so, uh, so, yeah, then, um, so now this, now the, uh, the threads in the story are starting to tie together, and, spoiler alert, you know, a lot of stuff happens, and then, um, Loki reaches a point where he has to, um, kill Darkiel, but Darkiel is, um, is given life back again by the uh, by by uh, by these uh, these beings that live on Thanatep that you know are just kind of regarded as you know these sort of parasitic sort of beings that looked hard but not quite and they've been at least they explain themselves to Loki that. They were horror, but they are the spirits of inceptions that have gone bad or just otherwise failed. So, and that is kind of alluded um, when the shit hits the fan with Dark Yell earlier in the book, but, you, you know, I just kind of 
made that connection sort of, but then it was spelled out for me. I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That all ties together. So, um, so yeah, the, uh, the, the, the Thanax of Thanatep. So these are the, these are, these are the, uh, the dead soul entities. They, um, they, they ritualistically, um, bring blood back into Darkiel and he is alive again. And it's, it's not actually, it, actually does not at all play out like a Christ allegory. I was really pleasantly surprised to see that, because usually you see something like that, and it plays out like a very thinly veiled Christ allegory. This was not. This played out more like a comedic mythology sort of allegory, which makes sense, because that is... Uh, God, I forget, the, I forget which deity in Egyptian mythology um, that seemed more similar to. But then again, Storm uh, Constantine, she does have a background in, um, in Egyptian um, stuff. I forget exactly what, but um, she's written a few books on, um, on Egyptian um, uh, high magics. So. so that makes sense. And like I said, I was very pleasantly surprised that it did not at all play out like a Christ allegory. I was like... Um, in fact, it took me a second to realize that it did not, <laughs> you know, after I finished reading it, because I'm just like, you know, I grew up Catholic, so of course, you know, like, you gotta see a Christ allegory and everything, and when this didn't happen, it took me, like, it took me a, a good hot minute after reading it to realize that it did not play out that way, and I was really happy with that. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, Dark Yell dies, but then is brought back to life. And Lilim decides, you know, that she's done with her self-imposed exile in the Great Library, and this is now pawn class. Like, this is his turn to, you know, spend uh, about ten years, because that, yeah, that's about how much time is gone over in this book. Not a whole lot happens in ten years. <laughs> At least not a whole lot, connect, you know, important to the story, anyway. Um... So yeah, like, you know, it's now Pond Class' turn to spend the next ten years in the Great Library, you know, learning everything he can learn. You know, it's still, you know, um, considered that Pond Class' time at the Great Library is going to be indefinite. Like, there's no set time when he's going to come back, though. It would be interesting to see if, uh, if uh, Storm comes back to this in any of the shorter stories that have been published uh, since. So, um... So, yeah, um, and, uh, and yet, um, you know, everybody has a fairly happy enough ending by the epilogue, and, um, and that's, that's the, that's the meat and bones of the story. There's a whole lot more going on with this world than I even said. In fact, like, that's one of the reasons I had to delete the first take of this, because I, you know, I, I went on for about a good 20 minutes, just all the background to this world that's been, you know, built that, you know, is revealed. Like, everything comes out, including, um, some, uh, some, some origin, you know, uh, backstory, though this is, you know, um, I've got a, I've got a, uh, book of, uh, short stories called Paragenesis, and in fact, one of the stories, the one by Storm Constantine, is called Paragenesis, which, you know, is the, uh, you know, and these are stories from the beginning of the Raithu, uh species. So, um, so yeah, a lot, it all ties up very neatly. Now, one thing that I really loved about this is that it really made me um, backtrack on uh, the Wraiths of, the Wraiths of Will and Pleasure, the, uh, the first book of this trilogy, because it, when I finished that one, I felt like if I wanted to end there, I could easily end there and feel like it was a satisfying story, and feel like this was, this was satisfying enough that, you know, it didn't really need to go anywhere else, that it had a nice, tight ending, and this one made me backtrack, and it's like, no, no, you need this to be really satisfied by how, uh, The Wraiths of Will and Pleasure um, ends, because, you know, it's like, when you read this, that one feels incomplete, and like I said, like, that, in, in the first video, um, 
of this trilogy. Um, Race of Will and Pleasure, it felt complete when I read it. When I, when I read it, you know, I ended it, and it felt like it could have easily ended there, that I could have easily put that one down and not gone back and not gone to any, and not gone to, gone to the other two books in, in the Histories trilogy, and it would have felt fairly satisfying. And, uh, and the second book, it definitely felt like you were picking up where something else left off, and, you know, it did feel like it wasn't complete. You know, it was very much a middle work, and this is very much an end work. You know, it does, you know, you read it, and it does feel like it's picking up where something else left off. It kind of begins a little bit, um, you know, giving you a little bit more exposition um, than a... Actually, no, I take that back. So, yeah, like, this definitely picks up where something else left off, but it brings everything together so perfectly that, yeah, I, I take back what I said about uh, about how the Race of Will and Pleasure felt like it could have easily stood alone by itself. Because, you know, it's just so much more satisfying to have this, um, you know, rounding out the story, especially the stories with Lilim. She is just so fascinating in this. Uh, she is she is a far more Gnostic-minded, um, she is far more Gnostic-minded than any other character in this series, uh, to at least to this to this point where I've read in here. She is she is honestly the most Gnostic minded. Like she she wants knowledge of both the physical and the metaphysical. She wants knowledge of everything. At least as much knowledge as she can physically, mentally, spiritually take in. She you know, she she wants to she wants to max out on on knowledge. And that is that is completely fascinating and admirable, and I love her character for that. She is just, she's just so much, and it's so wonderful every time. Uh, things that I didn't like so much was, um, uh, so Loki's kidnapped, and uh, Diablo, so Ponclast's older son, um, attempts to you know break his spirit for brainwashing, and so. Uh, um, Diablo is working more closely with this other, um, uh, entity race called the Hashmalim, and, uh, who are themselves working directly underneath another cosmic race. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are so many layers to this. You can easily see why I could ramble on, you know, like 25 minutes about shit. So, yeah, like, so Loki's finally broken for brainwashing by the Hashmalim, but that happens so far off camera that, you know, it, it's like, you know, we see him and he's, he's still thinking he's in charge at that point, and the next minute we see him, um, which is not the exact next minute, but, you know, like, the next time we see him, He's completely converted. He's com converted he, at that point. And it just, it, it feels like such an abrupt thing. That is one thing that I did not like. And honestly, that's my only real complaint, <laughs> to be quite frank. Um, whereas, like I said, you know, um, everything about Shades and Time of, Time of, everything I said I wasn't a huge fan of in Shades of Time and Memory is because, you know, like if you are reading it, um, you know, first off, if you're reading it for review purposes, you're reading it differently than you would normally read a trilogy. You're reading it, it with the idea in mind that you are going to rate this, uh, both as part of a series and as a standalone. Yeah, everything I didn't like about Shades of Time and Memory is that, you know, it, it just, it started in like your, you know, very clearly like you're picking up where something else left off. And it leaves with this very unfinished feeling. And you, um... It also has kind of an angstier tone than this one or Race of Will and Pleasure. Um, but, you know, again, when you consider everything that's going on, that makes sense for that book. Uh, this one... This one has... 
Um, this one kind of goes back and forth between the tones. Um, in some ways, it feels as very fresh-faced um, as Wraiths of Will and Pleasure, because, you know, like with Wraiths, we're following someone, or in this case, two, who are, you know, pure-born Wraithu, whereas, you know, Lulim was the, was, was the pure-born in, um, in Wraiths. So, I think we're good here. You know, I've said what I like, what I don't like, I've wrapped up the plot, and, again, there's, there's so much more than what I've said. So, yeah, this, it definitely has to be the last one you read. You know, it's very much part of a trilogy that way. And, uh, and yeah, so the, uh, the next, um, um, Raythu video book report I've got is going to be on Breeding Discontent, which is... Bah! Ah! Uh, uh, Wendy Darling and, uh, Brigitte M. Parker. Uh, as you see, I'm a little more than halfway through this one. And that's actually a fairly quick read. Um, I... I've been reading it a little longer than I thought I would, just because I haven't been on the bus quite so much. But, um, that said, uh, looks like, you know, like I said, looks like we're good to wrap up. So, bats and kisses, sweethearts, and I love you, and goodbye.